from Millville, New Jersey, and reaching around the world. New Life World Outreach Ministries presents His Word of Power with Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join us in a time of joyful worship, anointed ministry, and dynamic preaching from one of our Sunday morning worship services. It happens here on His Word of Power. Hi, 
Hi, this is Pastor Richard F. Myers. Join Helen and I as we walk the steps of Jesus in Israel. We'll explore all the important biblical sites, from the shores of Caesarea to the Valley of Armageddon. Then we'll go to the region of Galilee and even have a boat ride on the sea. We'll follow the ministry of Jesus throughout Israel. We'll have the opportunity to be baptized in the River Jordan. We'll float in the Dead Sea and take a gondola to the top of Masada. We'll spend time together in Jerusalem, where we'll visit the Garden of Gethsemane. We'll walk the Via Della Rosa. And of course, we'll have communion at the tomb. For more information, go to www newlifeoutreach.org forward slash Israel. We'll see you there.
Amen. Let's get our Bibles open this morning to Genesis, the third chapter. Can you bring that down a little bit for me, please? That's loud. Genesis, the third chapter. We're going to read there an interesting passage of Scripture, and we're going to pick up where we left off several weeks ago uh, in this study of how to defend our faith. So if you will look there with me in Genesis, the third chapter, we're going to begin reading at the 22nd verse. Genesis, the third chapter, beginning at the 22nd verse. And the Lord said, Behold, the man is become as one of us, to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the garden of Eden to till the ground from whence he was taken. So he drove out the man and placed at the east of the garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for the reality of the truth of your word. I give you glory, Lord, for everything that you're doing with your word. And today, Lord, as we look into the perfect law of liberty, it gives us the freedom that we so desperately need. Freedom in Christ, freedom in the anointing, freedom in worship, and above all, freedom just to love on you. So we thank you for that now in the mighty name of Jesus and all of God's people said, amen. Amen. So let's pick up where we left off here. It seems as though God has now created the earth. In that creation, he has taken and formed the, the land, the sea, the stars, the moon, the animals. He then creates his own image in the form of a man. And when he creates this man, he gives him certain requirements to be able to live successfully in the Garden of Eden. I want you to know as a believer today, God has given us commandments to live successfully as a Christian. Somebody say amen. And when we follow those commandments, we live successfully and God is able to multiply his blessings on us. So now we have man in in the garden. He is alone and God says, it's not good to let this man be by himself. We got to bring him a helpmate. Puts Adam to sleep. Adam uh, uh, is now asleep and God takes from his rib a woman or a bone of him and creates a woman. And now he has a man and a woman in the Garden of Eden, and he has given them the commandment that you can eat anything you want, you can talk to any of the animals, you can do anything you'd like, I'll take care of you in the garden, just don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So now we have the command and all of a sudden in this scene, the serpent comes along and he deceives the woman. We learned last time we were together on this subject that apparently all the animals and the humans, the two of them, could all speak to each other because the serpent speaks to Eve and deceives her. And when he does that, the first thing that happens is God shows up in the, in the garden and he's looking for his man and his woman and he can't find them. So he calls out and he says, Adam, where are you? Adam responds and says, well, I was naked and I, I was afraid. And God said to Adam, who told you you were naked? And he said, oh, you ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, didn't you? And so uh, the man says, well, yes, but I did it because the woman made me do it. Doesn't that sound like a lot of men today? The woman made me do it. The woman said, wait a minute, it's not my fault. The serpent made me do it. He deceived me. And so now I'm in a position where I'm taking the blame, but it's really his fault, the serpent. Now, if you read on and you would see that God said to the serpent in the second chapter of Genesis, he said, you've been walking upright, but now you're going to crawl on your belly because you did this. 
And then we come to this place now where in the garden, God cannot leave them because if they eat from the tree of life, their current situation will last forever and there's no hope. So he ejects them from the garden, and that's where we picked up. He ejects them from the garden there in the 23rd verse. He drove them out, and now he has a, a guard and a flaming sword that's guarding the entrance to the Garden of Eden. What most of us don't realize with this story up to this point is that they had everything provided for them. Everything they needed, God took care of. Everything that needed to sustain the earth, God took care of. They didn't have to labor. They didn't have to toil. Everything was provided for them at this point in their lives. But now man and woman are ejected from this garden of Eden. And he puts these cherubims, angels of the Lord, and a flaming sword. What we don't realize is that that flaming sword and those angels were not just to keep man and woman out of the garden. It also kept Satan out of the garden. And it keeps him out of the garden so he can't get a hold of the tree of life and cause us, you and I, some serious problems for the rest of our lives. Man is now in a position where he is connected to God, but not in the same provisional manner that he was. Now man has to choose to serve God. Now God, man has to choose to allow God to be his authority in his life. And so now because of that, you and I are under the curses of the fallen man. Here's what we don't realize happened that day. That day when this event took place in our lives or in their lives, and man fell and sin entered and all the rest of the things, what we don't realize is that now Satan no longer has connection to God directly like he used to. Now he must go through man to get to God. That's why if you read in the book of Job where he went up and accused, he's the accuser of the brethren, he accused Job and said, well, you got your hand of protection on him. Why did God have his hand of protection on Job? Did he like Job better than you? No. Did he like him better than me? No, because I'm the apple of God's eye, so I know he didn't like him better than me. You're supposed to say amen there, and you're supposed to say so am I. Thank you. So now he's the accuser of the brethren and he is accusing Job. So why was God protecting Job? Because Satan said in the third chapter, if you take your hands off of him, he'll deny you. And then you can read the whole rest of the book of Job and you'll see how all these calamities came on him, but he still didn't deny God. So what happened there? Why was God protecting him? Because Job was following the laws and the commandments of God. And because he was, God protected him. Anytime you decide to follow the commands and laws of God, God's got your back. Somebody say amen, please. He's got you covered. He's got you so covered that the enemy can't, cannot get into your life unless you open the door and let the guard down. And how do you do that? The same way Adam did. Adam sinned, that opened the door, and now you are the connection to God for Satan to get to. If he wants to get to God, he's got to get to you. If he can get to you, he can shame God. You know, as we lock, uh, watch what's happening in society today, he's rejoicing because it looks like he has shamed God with all the abortions and all the LGBTQ or whatever it is now, all that stuff. It looks like he has shamed God. But I'm going to tell you something. The battle's only begun and the victory hasn't been won yet. Somebody say amen, please. Come on, say it out loud. So now we have Adam and Eve in the garden. They are now being ejected. But what's interesting is up to this point, man is living by faith in God. 
up to this point in his life, up until the point he is ejected, he just believes that God will supply all his needs. And that's why the word of God says, my God will supply all your needs according to my riches and glory, his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. So what does that tell us? If you want to get restored back to where Adam was, you first need to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. The moment you do that, he's got your back. Somebody say amen. Whatever you do, don't drop your shield of faith. Whatever you do, don't take off the helmet of salvation. Whatever you do, don't take off the breastplate of righteousness. Keep your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And if you do those things, you say, but pastor, they're so hard. No, they're not. Let me tell you something. I love this man. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry, this woman. for such a time as this. That's right. I love this woman. I mean, I really love this woman. I don't have to stop and think, how do I love thee? Let me count the ways. <laughs> how many know what that is from school? Come on, you should know that. I don't have to stop and think, what am I gonna do to show her my love? What am I gonna do? I'm gonna come home when I'm done work. I'm going to take her out to some place. You know, it doesn't matter whether we're just walking on the boardwalk or we're eating in a fancy restaurant or we're eating at Popeye's. Yay, Popeye's. <laughs> it doesn't matter. I don't have to think about it. She doesn't have to think about how she's going to love me. It's automatic. It's like by faith, you know? By faith, I'm going to love her. I'm going to love her with my attention. I'm going to love her with my time. I'm going to love her with this sexy body. Danielle, what you putting your hand over your face for? <laughs> See, I'm gonna love her. It's just gonna come. That's what was happening to Adam in the garden. He didn't have to think. He didn't have to weigh, oh, all the consequences. He was living by faith because all of his needs were now met by God. But at this point in time, when God sets up the angels at the entrance, and the flaming sword at the entrance, he now fully institutes the free will of man. From this moment on, from this very second, man's free will will have to decide good or evil. Christ, heaven, devil, hell. So no longer is it now automatic. No longer does he just live in relationship with God. Now it becomes an act of your will. Now man, the free man now has to make moral decisions because they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil before God took care of all that. Now we have to decide, will we be evil or will we be good? Will we accept Christ and go to heaven? Will we, will we reject Christ and go to hell? And that's the easy part of it. The hard part of it for us to understand is this. He's freed man of God's, of, of his own moral oversight. He now no longer left this man in a situation where he didn't have to worry about anything. The man now had to choose from right and wrong because of eating of the tree. So now the man has this free will and what happens is at that moment, God transfers the responsibility of survival from himself to us because of that man, Adam. Before God took the responsibility of survival, now because of this, now we have to have the responsibility of making sure we survive in this world unless through submission, we return back to Christ by the acceptance of him as our Lord and savior. The moment we do that, 
the responsibility for our good life now becomes his again. Please say amen. In fact, Matthew, the sixth chapter, don't turn there. The 24th verse says this, no man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and mammon, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Now that word mammon means nothing more than self-confidence in your own worth, in your own ability. So you can't serve your own self-worth and your own self-ability based on your financial wherewithal. You now have to provide for yourself through your own abilities or you can submit to God and go back into that place where God says, just seek me first. Just look for me. Just take, take all your attention and put it on me and I'll take care of the rest. And if you're reading in the sixth chapter of Matthew, you'll see where God says, take no thought about what you should eat, what you should wear, what you should drink and all the other stuff, what you should clothe yourself with, where you should live. I'll take care of all that. When does he take care of that? When we submit ourselves back to God. Somebody say amen, please. Because this is the simple form of where we're at today. We have a free will that God has instituted in our lives. And now we can only walk by faith again when we submit our will to his will. That's what Jesus did. Jesus said in the garden as he's going to face the cross, Father, if you can take this from me, I'd really appreciate it. But if you can't, your will be done, not my will. And why did he do that? Because by submitting to his will, he submitted to the authority of God, the creator, the father God, and all the resources and all the power that was available to him. So now he's taken Jesus, just like we're commanded to do. Jesus now takes the authority of his own self-survival. He transfers that to God. God then turns around and empowers him to be able to live victoriously and face the obstacles of the cross. And the Bible says that he endured the agony and the pain and the shame and everything else of the cross for the joy that was set before him on the other side of the cross. You know what? On the other side of your salvation, is the joy set before you. The joy set before you. James 4, 7 says this, submit yourself to God, then resist the devil and he will flee from you. You know what that does? It breaks the connection for the enemy to get to God to accuse you. So when I set myself in submission to God, I transfer all that stuff over to what God has, what God knows, what God's power is, what God's will is, what God's word says, what God's ways are. I transfer all of that back to him. Please say amen. And what I like about that is the power that that engulfs me with when I've submitted myself to the Lord Jesus Christ because now I've redeemed myself from the curse of the law through the blood of Jesus on the cross and now I can walk in victory and I can have communion with the Father. I can do all the things that Adam enjoyed in the garden because now I've been redeemed from all the things of self-preservation. I don't have to do that anymore. Please say amen to that. I can turn to God and say, God, I believe you for my meals today. God, I believe you for my, my health today. God, I believe you for my food today. I believe you for where I'm going to live today. You heard Pastor Wayne give you a testimony today that he came to church. And you know how many times I tell you, if I can just get to church. He got to church this morning. His nose was clogged up. There's no way he could have played that solo today unless God showed up and God showed up. Somebody say amen. amen. God shows up whenever you invite him. Say amen, please. Come on, say it out loud. See, Jesus 
had the Father show up for him in his strength, in his ability to submit to the Father himself. And I love that because it gives to us a freedom that we didn't have before. I love this. Just, just listen to this in Acts, the 26th chapter, in the 18th verse. I'm sending you, and this he's talking to Paul, I'm sending you to open the eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan unto God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith which is in me. So the moment I have faith in Jesus Christ, I am also having faith in all the promises of God for my life. God said, I'm, I, I'm the Lord thy God that healeth thee. Boom. God says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and I'll add all these other things. Boom. I believe that because I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe that God will deliver us. I believe God will confirm his way to us. I believe all those things. Why? Because they come now as part of the package deal when I submitted myself to Christ. And so now I am submitted to Christ. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Everybody say amen. amen. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And now I have this amazing ability to transfer all my responsibilities of survival unto God through my relationship with Jesus. Why do I want to do that? The Bible gives me some clear answers to that. The problem is in free will, you and I can make all the choices we want. Anytime you decide, you can walk away from God. Anytime you decide, you can believe God that he'll meet your needs. Anytime you want, you can make a free will choice. The problem with that is you don't always know the consequences of your free will decision, but God always does. God sees what you can't see. God knows what you don't know. And every time you make a decision, you're making the decision based on what you think or what you can see. Based on that factor, you're making decisions hoping that this will happen or that will happen. When we submit our decisions to Christ in th or to God the Father through Christ, then we allow God to apply to us what he knows and what he sees that we can't. And the moment we do that, we just enjoy victory after victory after victory after victory. Please say amen to that. See, now man is free to make the decision unless he resubmits himself to God through Christ Jesus to make the decisions for him. So now we've got this place where you and I, as believers, are enjoying something that non-believers are not. We are not only in relationship with God through Christ, we are not only having all of our needs met because by faith we are walking, we walk not by sight, but by faith. So we're walking and believing Matthew 6 that says, you'll supply my needs, you'll take care of everything that I need, I'll submit to you, you'll help give me the strength to resist the devil and he'll get tired of trying to work on me and he'll go to somebody else. We enjoy that. That is our privilege as believers. But what if you're not a believer? Or what if you're a partial believer? What do you mean partial believer? You go to church, but you never made a commitment. Oh, you go to church and you know that's the right thing to do. But past that, you go party on Saturday nights. All those things. What happens to all the folks that are left out in the world? I was talking to God one day. This is many years ago. And I said, God, you got to answer a question for me. What about all of those people that have never heard about Jesus Christ? What happens to them? 
Frank is going to tell us. What happens to them? If they have not heard of Jesus Christ is the only way into heaven, are they all automatically going to hell? What's happened to them? And I say, God, you got to give me a clear cut answer on this because I know I'm not the only one answering this question. And as you get that free, ta- a free CD from Steve, for anybody who gives $1,000 towards the iPads, you get the answer to that question. How's that, Frank? That's a good money raiser, isn't it? Huh? We don't do potlucks here. We give answers for money. No, we don't. I said, God, what about those? Those in the jungles that have never heard. Those in the streets who have never heard. What about them? And God said, I've left them with a conscience. I said, what? He said, I've left them with a conscience. From the ancient tribal members in the darkest places of this earth, they have a conscience. The second thing I've left them with is visual identification with me. I said, what do you mean by visual identification with me? They never heard about you. They've never heard that Jesus Christ. What do you mean by that? And I remember him him saying this so clear to me. He said, look out the window and see the tree. That's me. He said, look out the window and see the sky. That's me. He said, look up and see the clouds that are circling around that are soon going to drop down rain. That's me. He said, look at the ground where the rain's going to fall and the things that grow up from the ground. He said, that's me. He said, so I've left them two witnesses. I've left them a conscience because every human being that is born on the face of this earth is born with a conscience. And a conscience is not co-science like it's spelled. It's a understanding that there is a right thing and a wrong thing and one is God and one is not. Somebody say amen. And those that are in the back darkest places of this world have that conscience built into them and they have the visualization of God in the trees, in the fish, in the food that they eat, in the palm trees that they make clothes out of to wear, whatever it is. He's left us with two witnesses, our conscience and the visible identification of him in everything that is created. Because he said to me, he said, even in the darkest places of this world, people know somebody greater than themselves created everything you can see. Hello? I just read in in the paper the other day that the biggest atheist in this country just accepted Christ at 85 years old. At 85 years old, he accepted Christ. At 85 years old, at 85 years old, that's cut it a little close. But the atheist who propagated that message around the world is famous around the world for being the leader of all atheists, decided that he could no longer deny the personal identification with the world around him. So how are they going to know? They're going to know by one of those witnesses or by both that somebody greater than ourselves created all this. And second, inside of us, there is this gift that he has deposited within us And that's the consciousness because that, the very consciousness in your life is the doorway to God's word, God's will, and God's ways. And the moment you are in a position of any place or doing anything, you will know whether it's right or wrong because God has deposited that gift into your life. And then he's backed it up with the evidence that somebody greater than ourselves 
has created all this. So then, pastor, if God has given every man, woman, and child born into this earth, whether they're in the darkest parts of Africa that has never heard the gospel or they live in Hollywood, if they all know what's right or wrong, how come they still keep doing wrong? The Bible addresses that and says something very clearly about that. In fact, it's found over in Romans, the third chapter. Would you turn over there with me, please? Ro I'm sorry, Romans, the second chapter. In Romans, the second chapter, if you look there with me at the 14th verse, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things that are contained in the law, let's stop right there. What that's simply saying is, even though you haven't heard the Gentiles, that's what they're referring to. Let me read that part again. Even if you haven't heard, listen to this, for when the Gentiles, which have not the law, in other words, it's all those people in biblical days that have not heard the message of salvation. They don't know the laws of, of the Ten Commandments. They don't understand all the books uh, you know, of the Pentateuch. They don't understand any of that. It says here, even though they don't have that, but do by nature the things that are contained in the law. In other words, they don't know the Ten Commandments, but they still do them. They don't know God's will, but they still do it. They don't understand because they've never heard about this or that that God has laid down for us. When they do that, by nature, the things which are contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness. So watch this. God has left in us this conscience, which tells us and aligns us with God's word and God's will and God's way. It automatically does that. That's the gift that God has deposited within the man, within the woman. So our conscience now becomes the voice of God's word to us, the voice of God's will, the voice of God's ways to us. And if we hearken unto that and do it, even though we don't know the law, then he acknowledges that. But then it goes on to say in the word of God over in John, the eighth chapter, the ninth verse, don't turn there. And they which heard it, heard what? Heard their conscious speaking, convicted by their own conscience. In other words, they heard something that said, you're not doing this right. This isn't right what you're doing. Or no, you shouldn't be doing that. Or no, you know what? You really shouldn't be here in this place. See, because each one of us, whether we're saved or not, know when we're doing wrong. We know. Before you accepted Christ, you knew what was right and what was wrong. I did. I know as a teenager, I knew when I did things that I shouldn't be doing. I knew I wasn't supposed to do it. But I did it anyway, so there. And that's exactly what you did too. You knew it wasn't right. You knew you shouldn't have been doing it, but you did it. It's that same thing that happens to you is, you know, when you go into some place and you feel like you shouldn't be there. Anybody ever have that experience? You go into some place and say, oh, something doesn't feel right here. I, something that, yeah, that, you know why you feel that way? because you shouldn't be there. You shouldn't be there, so God's conscience is telling you you shouldn't be there. Hey, buddy. You. He's waving to me. I'm waving back. I'm sorry. You shouldn't be there. So watch. So now, in order for me to continue to do something that my conscience is telling me don't do. 
Now, we're at a much lower level than you are as a Christian because you ought to be listening to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit is kind of keep you out of those places so you never even have to make the decision as to whether it's good or evil. Somebody say amen because you transferred that authority back to God. So if you just listen and, the, and the, the word of God says that the Holy Spirit speaks in a still small voice. So you got to be listening. Hello. But if you listen, you'll hear God through the Holy Spirit tell you, don't do that. Don't go there. Stay over here. Go over this way. Get away from those people and so on. But if you don't, if you're not in that place, you have to choose between right or wrong. And so when you do that and you violate your conscience in order to sin against God's laws, physical laws, mental laws, spiritual laws, emotional laws, all the rest of the laws that God has, when you do that, you've done it because you've seared your conscience. Do you know if I hang around with somebody who's doing drugs enough, I'll eventually do drugs? Hello? If I hang around with somebody who commits adultery all the time, I'll eventually commit adultery. If I hang around angry people, I will eventually become angry. Why? The Bible tells us bad company corrupts good morals, 2 Corinthians Bad company corrupts good morals. You are a product of your environment and those people you hang around with. That's why it's important for you to choose who you hang around with. Please say amen. And now God's word says something specific about that. In 1 Timothy, the fourth chapter, first through second verses, just write it down and I'll, I'll read it to you. Now the spirit speak it expressly. That word expressly means distinctly. That in the latter time, some shall depart from the faith. Now watch what happens. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared, having their conscience seared. Let me tell you something. You want your conscience seared? Constantly put into your spirit the things that will sear it. The more you put into your spirit, man, of whatever it is, it will either build you up or tear you down. Hang around enough with people doing drugs and your conscience will be seared and you'll say, well, that's really not so bad. I might just try it. Why? Because you've taken that part of God that says, I've left a deposit in you and you've seared it and you've closed it up. And when you do that, you are vulnerable to the enemy's attacks. Please say amen. When God says to us, bad company corrupts good morals, that could easily be translated and say, the people you hang around with will influence your conscience. It says the same exact thing. Because if I hang around with the wrong people enough, I will become the wrong people. If I hang around with people that are good, if I hang around with people that have the light of God in them, I will become the light of God. Because as a believer... You have a much higher authority working in your life than just your conscience. You have the Holy Spirit. And where the Holy Spirit dwells and is given free reign, there is no darkness. Next week, when we get together again, I want to talk to you a little bit more about this. Because in this is where we find the ability to destroy life, where we destroy natural inclinations of man and woman. It's where we find the ability to do all the things that you see happening in this world. 
because conscience have been seared. Bow your heads with me. Jesus. Father, I thank you today. Thank you for the reality of who we are in Christ. God, we realize by simply accepting Christ as our Lord and Savior, that God, we enter into that place where we walk by faith, where we can trust you for all of our survival deeds. And in addition to that, you open the windows and you pour out blessings on us above our basic needs of life. And God, it's happened all because we've allowed the Holy Spirit entrance into our consciousness, not just our conscience, but our consciousness what we are aware of and the decisions that we make. For we've surrendered those to the power of the almighty God, you Father in heaven. And because we've done that, the reality of the ability to overcome all the attacks of the enemy is now at our disposal. And so Father, I thank you today. I thank you for that revelation that God, you have left for us a witness in the mouth of two or three witnesses, the evidence of your presence and the conscious, the gift to mankind of what's right and what's wrong. God, let us be able to be the witness for you and to bring many others into the fullness of the kingdom of the living God. Your head is still bowed and your eyes are still closed. Maybe there is somebody here today you've never accepted Christ or you did a long time ago, but somewhere's along the line. You got detoured, but you know today is the day you need to return to Christ. You need to give your heart back to him. You need to reestablish the connection with God Almighty. If you're here this morning and you fit either one of those categories, I wanna pray one last prayer. If you're here this morning and you've never accepted Christ or you did, but you got detoured and you know you wanna recommit with him again and you wanna be included in this final prayer, would you slip your hand up right now quickly so I know that you will be included in this prayer. Anyone here quickly. Father, if there is one here, I thank you this morning that today would be the day that the Savior rises again in their lives. I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. de Nueva Vida New Life Church Muchas gracias Thank you so much por enviar al pastor y a Josué for sending pastor and Josué a la fiesta Tarahumara for the Tarahumara uh, festivities Ha sido tres días excelentes It's been three excellent days Celebramos 30 años de servicio misionero We celebrate 30 years as a missionary Y yo quiero agradecerles a ustedes I want to thank you all a toda la iglesia to the whole church por el apoyo for the support por el, la oración for the labors que han hecho para a favor de nosotros. That you've done for all of us. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Que mi Dios that God les siga bendiciendo. Continue to bless you. Que les bendiga, hermanos. Gracias. God bless you all. Thank you. Gracias por enviarnos al pastor. Thank a you for sending pastor and the brother. Tener este tiempo para compartir. And to have this time to join together. Dios les bendiga. God bless you. Sigan orando por Continue nosotros. praying for us.
y es hermosa la heredad que me ha tocado. Bendeciré a Jehová, levante su mano y diga, bendeciré a Jehová que me aconseja. Aún en las noches me enseña mi conciencia. A Jehová he puesto siempre delante de mí porque está a mi diestra. No seré conmovido. Amazing. Vamos a, a levantar nuestra voz a la hora de orar. Lo puede hacer, dígame amén. Y yo agradezco al Señor por la vida del presbítero Guillermo Rodríguez. Esta es la segunda vez que nos visita en la misión Tarumara. La primera lo metimos hasta Corariachi. And just like the rivers of water, y así como los ríos de agua, he turns the king's heart any way he wants. Él cambia el, el corazón del rey en la forma que él quiera. Just imagine that. Solo imagina eso. The person that doesn't like you. Aquella persona que no te quiere. The person that gives you a hard time on es, your job. Esa persona que te está Listen, listen, listen. God is speaking to you right now. God is bringing breakthrough to you right now. I'm going to tell you right now what God is doing. What God is calling you to. Oh, Jesus. Hi, this is Pastor Myers. I pray you enjoyed our broadcast today, and I wanted to let you know that our church family would love to have you join us here in our sanctuary for one of our weekly services. Every Sunday morning, we have dynamic worship, powerful preaching, an awesome children's church, and we see the power of God as he ministers to his family. Our Sunday services begin at 11 a.m. Then on Wednesday nights, we have ministries for the entire family. We have adult worship and Bible study and our blast zone for kids 5 to 12. It's a night packed with the presence and power of God, and that happens at 7.15 every Wednesday night. For more information about New Life Church, you can go to our website at newlifeoutreach.org. There you'll find all the information you need to be part of our great church, and you'll see what God is doing in the lives of our families. Until our family meets your family on our next broadcast, may God richly bless you and yours.